are we supporting, is the United States supporting the violation of human rights by other forces? And uh, one of the things we wanted to look at was, what is the US role in this? Because that focus on other nations' militaries reinforces the whole idea of American exceptionalism. So what is American exceptionalism? Uh, there's this quote here from Madeleine Albright. Um, if we have to use force, it is because we are America, we are the indispensable nation. So when uh, there are, you know, I think you have all heard people talk about the good guys and the bad guys, and we are going after our forces and our allies, are going after the bad guys, and our forces and our allies are the good guys. This kind of uh, Manichaean division um, between uh, good and bad. So when, a part of that of course is that when the good guys do something wrong or they murder a civilian, it's uh, an exception. Um, but when the bad guys do something wrong, it is part of the pattern of what the bad guys do. So I, uh, just to review what Plan Columbia is, it began in, at the end of the Clinton administration uh, as a, at least nominally, in order to go after the drug trade. The idea was to cut the amount of coca grown in Colombia by half within five years. And the, the main strategies undertaken were to uh, fumigate and to go after um, the leftist guerrillas, the FARC and the ELN, um, and to do that partially by going after their um, sources of funding, which include um, uh, drug trafficking. Uh, a lot of the, the tactics that were used were um, to increase air mobility in order to get troops out to where the guerrillas were based, um, uh, as well as uh, training and, um, and uh, sharing of intelligence. Now, so where has the assistance gone? One of the things that we did was we obtained lists of all the units in the Colombian military that have received U.S. assistance since the year 2000. And um, then we mapped it according to the jurisdictions of the Army brigades that received the assistance. And sorry about this. Um, so you can see that um, this is over the course of 10 years. You can see a lot of the assistance has uh, focused in the south. Um, this is Ecuador over here, this is Venezuela over here, Panama, Pacific, Atlantic. And uh, the FARC guerrillas, although they were all over the country, a lot of their um, uh, concentration is in this area. Um, there's a lot of oil over in this area, and so some assistance was concentrated here in order to protect the pipeline that was going to the Caribbean. And then this is where uh, kind of was the cradle of paramilitarism in the country. And uh, uh, it's unclear exactly why assistance was going there. Um, this is also a drug corridor. And uh, in the last few years, a lot of US assistance has been going to this area, which is also a focus of great, great violence. Most of you know about what the School of the Americas is. It is one of the institutions that the United States uses in order to train uh, foreign uh, Latin American forces. Um, Colombia sends more soldiers to the School of the Americas in Georgia than any other country in Latin America, but it's only one of uh, more than 35 institutions in the United States where the U.S. trains Colombians. Um, on the other hand, um, you can see that the whole, basically the whole command structure of the Colombian Army has gone through the School of the Americas. Uh, after 2001, after 911, uh, assistance in Colombia was also became a counterinsurgent. Um, strategy. So they, uh, uh, the U.S. openly went after the insurgency uh, as a counter-terrorist strategy. And throughout all of this, in both the drug war and in the counter-insurgency, both the U.S. and the Colombian military see legitimacy as a key component, as the center of gravity of the war. That is, that the, the Colombian armed forces needs to be seen as legitimate and that the U.S. assistance actually plays a role in legitimizing the Colombian armed forces both in the international community and um, within Colombia. Now, one way that this legitimacy happens and a way that many liberals end up voting for the aid is through human rights law, human rights policy and human rights law. 
So one of the key provisions, not just for Colombia, but for all foreign military <coughs> aid, to, to uh, supposedly protect human rights where the U.S. is assisting foreign militaries is something called the Leahy Amendment, which began in 1997, and it prohibits, by law, it prohibits all assistance to any foreign military unit um, for which there is credible evidence that members of the unit have committed a gross human rights violation, unless those members have been brought to justice. Um, so again, this is the focus on the other, on the, the violations and the, the uh, destructiveness of the other, but it's a key uh, tool, it can be a key tool in trying to get uh, human rights to be respected. Um, so we heard from the State Department that Colombia is the country where the Leahy Amendment is being implemented better than anywhere else in the world. And since increasingly the way the U.S. military is operating is by assisting others, by cooperating with others, and not just doing it themselves, um, it becomes a very key question of whether the Leahy Amendment is being implemented. If you care about human rights, then that would be a key component in, in terms of any kind of foreign military assistance. So we looked at three things then. We looked at, is the Leahy Amendment being implemented in Colombia, and what would implementation require in Colombia? Second, we wanted to see, what is the impact after the assistance? Because the Leahy Amendment looks at what happens before the U.S. is assisting. What happened before? But what happens after the U.S. assistance is given? What is the record of these militaries after the assistance is given? Because that then turns the lens onto the U.S. role and what is the impact of what the U.S. is doing. And third, we wanted to see, okay, if, this is, if Colombia is the best example of, of implementation of the Leahy Amendment, what does that mean for the rest of the world? Through uh, Senator Leahy's office, we got a list of all uh, the units in the Colombian military who had received assistance since the year 2000. Um, and we also worked with the uh, Colombian military data about where all the different army brigades operate. And then from Colombian human rights organizations, we got a list of more than 3,000 um, civilian killings <coughs> by the Colombian, Colombian armed forces since the year 2002. Who they were, where it occurred, in many cases, which unit committed it. Um, and then we also worked, we had uh, data from the Colombian Attorney General's and Prosecutor General's uh, um, office. So where, these 3,000 killings, what happened? Okay, you can say it's a war, but one of the things that happened was that in 2005, after Plan Colombia had already had several years to work, after um, Alvaro Uribe had been president for three years, the Defense Ministry issues a directive which codifies a body count strategy. Uh, and it pays civilians and members of the military, if they can uh, recruit a civilian to do it for them, for uh, dead guerrillas, for dead members of illegal armed groups. And um, it you know, gives the amounts, how you verify that the person has been dead, everything, you know, it basically lays out how we're gonna claim the dead and have this body count strategy. And that strategy, um, together with uh, very high levels of impunity for civilian killings and a uh, propendency to not distinguish between civilians and combatants, which is historical for the Colombian Armed Forces, but has also been uh, central to the rhetoric of the Colombian civilian government for the last 10 years, um, led to what was known as false positives in which uh, the, the, the classic case is uh, the Colombian military works with a civilian who recruits a young man in a poor neighborhood, turns him over to the military. The military takes him to another part of the country, executes him, puts a gun in his hand or a radio by his side, puts maybe a uniform over him even after the bullet holes have gone in, and then claims him as a guerrilla killed in combat. And of the 3,000 cases that we analyzed, most of them, the large majority of them, were considered to be false positives. The impact was that for the, the when we tried to isolate the impact of U.S. military aid, and um, by looking at where there were increases to a unit of, of assistance, and what was the record in terms of civilian killings before and after with that unit, and found that for the large, 20 largest increases, there was a 56% on average 
increase in the number of killings in the two years after the increase rela related to before is that when um, aid was decreased to a unit, there was a decrease in killings by, by that unit in the two years afterwards, which to me says that the United States has an opportunity to actually decrease the number of killings by um, uh, decreasing the assistance. This, in this map, the circled stars represent the number of extrajudicial killings um, uh, in the year 2002 to 2004 in that jurisdiction. And the density of aid represents, the density of color represents the amount of aid in that region. And you can see that um, while in some areas where the aid is not as intense, there is a large number of killings, in all of the areas where there is U.S. assistance, there is a record of uh, previous extrajudicial killings by those units. In other words, if the Leahy Amendment were being implemented in Colombia, the U.S. Have to, would have to suspend assistance to every single territorial brigade and most of the mobile brigades. There is, uh, last October, there was a military base agreement signed between the U.S. and Colombia that gives the U.S. access to at least seven military bases. Um, this in many, for 10 years. So at a time when the State Department was saying they were going to nationalize Plan Colombia and basically wind down the level of assistance, this puts it into place for another 10 years and also gives it a regional scope because the mission for those bases is regional. It's not just within Colombia, which is bad enough. So um, that, that's part of what created the hullabaloo around the military base agreement. And um, you probably heard about uh, Venezuela and Ecuador were very upset about it. So it was Brazil and Argentina and most of the South American nations. Um, this was uh, concurrent with a discourse by the Pentagon, which is saying that Colombia is a great example of counterinsurgency and of the drug war that should be exported to other situations such as Mexico and Pakistan, um, uh, even uh, uh, so they're, they're, they're selling training. The Colombian military is selling training to other countries. They're also collaborating with the United States. So for example, Colombian troops are going to Afghanistan this summer. Um, they're training Mexican helicopter pilots. A lot of this is in collaboration with the United States. Um, and they're even doing this in order to train uh, other nations in human rights. Um, one of the ways in which the U.S. military presence is being sold is that this is not just counterinsurgency, this is for humanitarian disasters. Um, just this month, we got a little taste of what that kind of humanitarian assistance might look like because U.S. Marines were training Colombian Marines in uh, uh, humanitarian assistance and basically saying that when you have uh, any kind of a disaster, natural disaster, that you have to have riot control. You have to have um, military forces, just like in Katrina, like in, in, in Haiti after the earthquake, sending in military forces as a way of controlling the population rather than letting that population help itself. A week and a half ago, the Colombian Constitutional Court threw out the military base agreement because the agreement was not submitted to congressional approval in Colombia. The struggles against the bases in Colombia are not only legal challenges, there's a lot of grassroots protests. There's a co broad coalition within Colombia that's formed um, uh, in order to oppose the bases, and they are looking for increasingly, they're looking for international solidarity. Um, there was just uh, this past week uh, a international mobilization uh, organized by Colombian women that went to one of the bases that was focused on opposing the bases. School of the Americas Watch about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, also held a protest at one of the bases. Uh, there is a continental campaign uh, that is attempting to address or respond to the increasing militarization not only of the United States, not only in Colombia, but throughout Latin America.